Friends, after some spicy Twitter drama from former Senators player Mark Mathot, you know, Winnipeg needed to give the Senators a bit of Winnipeg hospitality. Maybe they didn't get to visit all the nicest restaurants. Maybe they even found their hotel stays a little lacking. But either way, the Jets welcomed Ottawa with a nice 5-1 to one victory, sending them home packing without uh, zapping sheets and all that. We'll talk about how the Jets performed in a pretty big victory on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey friends and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is 100% free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Now, on tonight's episode, like I said, the Jets defeated Ottawa 5-1, to showed them some quality Winnipeg hospitality, and sent the Sens packing with a bit of a disappointing uh, defeat. But, you know, for the first 20 minutes or so of this game, the Jets actually weren't playing as neatly as you'd like them. In fact, I think Winnipeg, for the most part, probably wouldn't love the first period except for the scoreline. Uh, the Jets were definitely getting outshot. Ottawa looked faster and more aggressive. And if the Sens actually got good goaltending from Cam Talbot, this game might have looked a little bit different. You know, the Jets, for the most part, I think they're dealing with fatigue. You've got injuries. And based on, you know, the, the interview that they had with Pierre-Luc Dubois during one of the uh, mid-period intermissions, it sounds like a lot of the guys are sick. I mean, Dubois, frankly, was barely able to talk. Uh, he was kind of coughing, and, and certainly his voice was hoarse. So these guys are going through it, let's be real. Uh, and I'm not sure that this is really an ex- a thing that's exclusive to the Jets, but I think when Winnipeg has as many injuries as it does and likely is struggling to kind of cope with you know, managing call-ups and things like that, every single guy that gets sick and reduces their performance out there It just makes it that much more taxing for everyone else, and it puts a lot of strain on the squad. You know, this team is not healthy, and you can kind of tell at times that Winnipeg is a step slower than it's been at other points during the season. There is a bit of a Christmas holiday break coming up, but that's only after the Jets have a back-to-back on the road in Boston and Washington, right? So that's a pretty brutal uh, end to the schedule. Not exactly like the Jets have had the hardest last few weeks in terms of opponents, but All the same, you know, when you're feeling sick and you're kind of banged up, you do need a little bit of a morale boost and something to keep you going, especially when you're just not feeling 100 percent and at your best. And I think that first period for the Jets probably was a pretty good sign that, yeah, you know, Winnipeg is flagging a little bit and maybe they're just not feeling up to the task as much as they would under other circumstances. But you know what? Sometimes that doesn't really matter. And thanks to a couple of early goals from Kevin Stenland and Josh Morrissey, the Jets found themselves kind of opening up the account quickly and putting the onus back on Ottawa to really perform. The Sens did actually respond a few minutes later with a goal of their own from Drake Batherson on the power play, which, you know, like I said on the on the uh, previous episode, that was the one thing that you really didn't want to give Ottawa is is, po- or is power play chances. You know, anytime they're they're in a five v four situation. They've been pretty lethal, but other than that, David Riddick really handled the rest of everything that Ottawa threw at him. I mean, the Sens were kind of buzzing for a lot of the game. I mean, Ottawa created tons of chances down low. They had some really good seeing eye wristers that quite frankly could have taken a nasty little deflection and tested uh, Riddick to his fullest extent. But thanks to some good saves from him, where he mostly just used his big frame to sort of block out the, the net coverages, even if, you know, he couldn't always see the puck. It ended up not really mattering. You know, you could tell that there were moments where he wasn't really tracking the shot, but he still made the save anyways. And I 
I guess at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. And I thought that he did a pretty good job following up what was actually a pretty decent game against the Kraken too. Past couple of starts from him have looked a lot more like you'd expect a backup goalie to look, you know, pretty serviceable, pretty decent. And in this game, I thought that he stood really tall, which is great because Winnipeg hasn't always been able to rely on the backup. But past couple of years, we've seen guys like Comrie and Brassois really step up. So if Riddick can continue that trend, I think that'd be fantastic. But after that, you know, it seemed like the Jets sort of got things together. And, and you know, in the back half of the first period, Sam Gagne capped off what was a pretty explosive scoring sequence with a beautiful uh, six on five delayed penalty sequence with Gagne just sort of sneaking the puck by Talbot on the far right post. It was a great goal, probably not one Talbot's going to be happy with. But after that, you know, the Jets started kind of skating a little bit more, getting active. And in the second period, Kyle Connor added a brace to cap it off. Now, again, this wasn't the first um, uh, like a first period that I think the Jets would be thrilled with. And even into the second period, there were some moments where Winnipeg was a little shaky. And the last, you know, 20 or, or 30 minutes, you know, the Jets were definitely getting shelled. You know, Ottawa was creating lots of great chances off the rush. Winnipeg was a little bit careless with some of their puck management, but at the end of the day, the Jets got the job done and they won 5-1. So can you really be upset? <laughs> My opinion, probably not. I think this team has done an admirable job of really fighting through a lot this year. Um, this year, more than most, it kind of feels like they've just been really banged up and they, they've struggled to get healthy at any one time. It started with Ehlers going down. It's continued with the rest of the team continuing to uh, suffer different injuries, illnesses, all of that, but these guys will tell you, they fight for the badge, they really want to show Winnipeg a good time, and I think that they have made a wonderful account of themselves, you know, despite all of the circumstances that quite frankly could have sunk them to the bottom of the Central Division, but, you know, Rick Bonus seems like a great motivator, I think he's done a fantastic job with this team so far, and I look forward to seeing what he does with the rest of the season. Now, in just a little bit, I did want to focus on a couple of individual performances that I think are worth spotlighting, especially because uh, Vili Heinola actually did make his return to the Jets in this game. And I think that there's some really encouraging signs from him, especially for the long term, if the Jets want to make some changes with the roster composition. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at BetOnline.net. BetOnline is your number one source for all of the sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis you need this season, whether you're looking for odds and trends for professional or amateur sports. And uh, if you love, of course, college bowl season for college football, they've got you covered there. They've also got great basketball coverage. And if you're looking for some maybe European or other uh, international soccer, they've got uh, lingering World Cup coverage. They've also got the return to domestic league and competitions for all of these sports. And they've got even, you know, stuff like horse racing, automotive racing, and everything in between. But of course, for all of you, they've got hockey. And y'all love hockey. So be sure to subscribe right now and check up on all of the latest Winnipeg Jets lines and odds. But if you want to take a step back from sports, they've also got Vegas casino games because I know not all of you have your lives revolving around sports 100% of the time. But if it does, they've also got great sports podcasts and articles for you. So you'll always be plugged into your favorite sport like hockey wherever you go. If you're ready to get started, register right now for a free account at betonline.net because BetOnline is where the game starts. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We're recapping Winnipeg versus Ottawa, which was a pretty fun game for the Jets. Obviously, a great performance all around from the team in a couple of key categories. Maybe some moments where Rick Bonus wasn't thrilled. He actually said as much uh, in the postgame comments, saying that the puck management, even with the lead, was not particularly great. He didn't feel that. You know, he was happy with the number of shots the Jets gave up, and that's a pretty fair criticism. But overall, you know, Winnipeg won 5-1. I think that they'll take that, especially with, you know, the number of injuries and illnesses they're dealing with, and we'd love that, right? But in between, I thought that I would, I would focus on a couple of individual performances that I think are really worth breaking down, especially because they might hold some interesting clues for uh, future performances and roster changes that the Jets may need to make. 
Before we go any further, though, I just wanted to make sure that you make your second listen of the day locked on sports today. It features the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. It gives you instant reactions, game recaps, and locked on's take of the day. Locked on sports today is available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. So be sure to like, follow, and subscribe right now. Because again, we just really love and appreciate your support. And I also want you to stay up to date on your favorite world of sports. Now, taking a look back at the Jets, like I said, um, some really interesting standout performances and some things that were, you know, a, a couple of interesting tactical adjustments. Now, the first performance that I think is probably worth bringing up is um, Kevin Stenland. And Stenland, you know, I call him the Sten Gun. I think he's been a really solid addition to the team in the few games that he's played. You know, he's a he's a, he's a solid fourth line guy who brings a nice net front presence. He's not afraid to mix it up in the corners and walls. And he's actually pretty good when he's in possession of the puck. You know, he's not the, the fleetest of foot, and maybe he's not the kind of guy who's going to be like a huge offensive dynamo. But in terms of just being a really solid two-way forward with a, a net crashing ability, I think Stenland's done a good job. And it seems like his time with the Moose has certainly helped him to try and figure out how to get the puck on net, which for me is always one of the most important traits. I don't need it to be pretty. What I do need the Jets to do is just create offense however they can. And this year, I think Winnipeg has done a really good job of, you know, even when being outshot, the one thing that they're doing better than most teams that they're playing is creating tons of expected goal threat. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's all about where they're taking shots from, right? When you're looking at how Winnipeg creates off the rush, when you're looking at what they're doing once they're inside the offensive zone and looking to cycle, they're attacking really dangerous areas of the ice, which is not something that they did under Maurice as much. They used to take a lot of point shots, and they still do that. But we're seeing more dynamic passing with this team. You know, more cross-lot passing, more uh, opportunities created around the goal mouth. They're looking for more rebounds. There's just a lot more crisp passing and danger created off of the rush where the Jets are exposing defensive coverages and gaps and trying to get in between and find those perfect scoring lanes. Every now and then, maybe the Jets are overpassing here and there, but you really can't be upset with it. Um, and that benefits, you know, the bottom six as well. Guys like Stenland who can capitalize on these greasy rebounds, I think it's been a fantastic option for them. I think we're seeing lots of good production from the third and fourth lines, especially in, in using those shooting and passing lanes and creating that extra level of threat that maybe the, the bottom lines weren't being asked to do so much back under Maurice and previous coaching staff. So all, all in all, I think Stenland is just capping off what was a really strong shift from the bottom six. Um, not every player on the third or fourth line in this game had the best evening, but it is what it is. You know, you're not always going to see the third or the fourth line excelling. But when they do have a good game, you know, when Gustafson's kind of driving the bus on that fourth unit and pushing further up the ice, I think that is always really good to see. I think it's also worth spotlighting uh, some guys in the top six. I thought Shifley was quietly very effective. He didn't have any goals himself this game, but he was definitely creating tons of great opportunities. His passing, as always, was great. Uh, he had a couple of really nice one-time shots that he took that either just got saved or very nearly missed. And, of course, his uh, his partner in Cole Perfetti continues to really impress me. Cole had this one great two-on-one opportunity where he was actually being marked by a defender who stretched out to block the passing lane, but Perfetti still got the backhand pass off, and Shifley just barely had a great one-time opportunity to either get saved or missed. I think it was probably saved on this one, if I recall correctly, but you know, just inches away from scoring. Great chance created. And you can just see those two are, are complete dynamite together. I didn't think Carson Kuhlman on that line is, is fitting in quite as well as I would like. But, you know, Kuhlman, for the most part, is the guy that you would expect to be more like a, like a fourth line type. So as long as he just kind of fills in and, and eats up minutes, I don't think it's really anything to, to read too much into. But at some point, I do think the Jets probably want to find a longer term solution, especially because Ehlers might not be 100% when he comes back. And, you know, Wheeler's still out for like, a month plus. So uh, hopefully everyone gets healthy as soon as possible, but it is going to be a bit of a, a learning curve and, uh, you know, some growing pains as the Jets try and work through this. But on the second line, Dubois and Kyle Connor, I thought really made some good magic. Sam Gagne also contributing there as well. Uh, but Dubois and Connor just have an amazing link up together. And I hope that Dubois ends up committing long term because those guys, I, I think, really should be 
uh, a long-term partnership for this team. If Dubois commits to this this Jets squad long-term, you know, four or five years, I think the Jets are going to have a great time with him. And I think he'll have a great time with this team too. It, it's clear that he very much gets along with Connor. Connor and, and Dubois seemingly have this good spatial awareness of each other at all times where they're looking for each other. They're finding their opportunities together. And Connor had a couple of great goals off of some phenomenal passes and plays. Uh, one from Josh Morrissey on a fantastic slap pass, man, an unbelievable pass on the power play. And then, you know, uh, the, the second one was a nice little slot shot. Thanks to Dubois passing from the back of the net. So just a lot to really love with that top six offense. Um, and I think there's just signs of of really good things to come for this team that I am excited about. But uh, there are a couple of things that I think are worth discussing on the defensive side of things, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Hello, friends, and welcome back to these closing thoughts on tonight's episode of Lockdown Winnipeg Jets. We've been uh, talking about Winnipeg versus Ottawa and some final thoughts on what was a pretty solid game all around. Maybe the Jets conceded a few too many shots. Uh, maybe the defensive puck management wasn't great. But towards the back half of the game, I thought that there was a very interesting change that Bonus made. Uh, he swapped Pionk and Heinola. Heinola was, of course, starting for the first time in a while, uh, this time on the right side where Schmidt usually plays with Sandberg. Towards the end of the game, he actually flipped those pairings, though. Um, Pionk got moved to um, Sandberg and, uh, you know, Heinola got moved to Dylan, and we actually saw Dylan and Heinola play really well together. Heinola, up until this point, had already just been having a very solid game. You know, if you're looking for a guy who was actually doing a good job of making good zone exits, uh, pushing the puck up the ice, making some really smart passes, and just generally contributing to puck progression, Heinola was actually doing a lot of that. And I thought his defensive positioning was pretty decent as well. He had some nice puck steals thought he blocked off a couple of opposing skaters well and did his job defensively that you would ask for a guy who is on the smaller side. But when you paired him with Dylan, it just seemed like Dylan suddenly felt more at ease with the way that Heinola plays. When he's with Pionk, I've noticed a lot of slowness with him, a lot of hesitance, and I think it's partly because Pionk is a little bit chaotic when it comes to managing the puck, right? We all know that Neil tends to be a very high event kind of player, but that goes for and against you in equal measure. So it is difficult for Dylan, I think, who has to do uh, or has to try to do a lot more uh, of the details coverage. But alongside Heinola, he looked very comfortable, very at ease. And that pairing was constantly making zone exits, constantly getting the puck up the ice. And you just saw a very different side of Dylan. So if that's a pairing that can work long term, I think that's great. Uh, any way to get Dylan to be, um, you know, a lot more comfortable and a lot less chaotic with the puck, I think would be a fantastic thing. And if he works really well with Heinola, I think that's a pairing to watch for the future. Um, unfortunately, you know, Pionk did not do so well with Sandberg. He and Dylan just don't really work well together. I mean, Pionk in general doesn't really work well with any partner. And I think it was especially hard for Sandberg to try and uh, figure out how to manage the puck effectively with Pionk as his partner. And I think the bigger question for the Jets long term is what exactly Neil Pionk's future is with this team. As much as we all love Neil and as much as he's a super stand-up guy, a great on-ice leader and a great voice in the room, I just think the stuff that he does with the puck management and how he unfortunately has tanked a lot of the pairings that he's been on, it's putting a lot of stress on that back end. And if Heinola can do what he did on the right-handed side on a regular basis alongside somebody like Dylan, I think unfortunately for Pionk, it does kind of make him a lot more redundant than you'd think because yeah, then Schmidt could come back in and actually do a pretty good job uh, either on the second or third pairing. And we've seen that, you know, Dylan Schmidt sometimes a little bit, eh, but Sandberg and Schmidt, usually a pretty solid third pairing does exactly what you ask. And of course, Schmidt is kind of a harder sell in terms of moving his cap hit, but be because like Pionk scores a lot, you could probably get a, a pretty good forward or something in exchange uh, for his services. And I think, you know, Pionk's value as a right-sided defender definitely puts his name higher up on the market than you'd normally expect. So it's something to track. I don't know if it's going to happen this season, but I think long-term, if we kind of keep seeing this stuff with Heinola being played on that offside and maybe getting moved into different uh, roles with that, that blue line unit, it might show Chevy what he wants to do with that roster and who he can kind of make 
a little bit more expendable to potentially bring in some attacking help because that that is still something that the Jets do need and I think it would be great to bring in uh, some really good high end right wing depth especially with how uh, the Jets are currently a little bit thin there and honestly could still use the help even with a lot of the guys you know getting back to full strength so something to keep an eye on but I'd be curious to know what you think of that defensive unit did you like the D- Dylan Heinle pairing what did you what did you think of Winnipeg's performance overall who was your MVP of the game. Mine probably would have been either Riddick or Josh Norris or Josh. <laughs> I just called him Josh Norris. Uh, the, the meme is starting to set in. You know, Morrissey had a phenomenal night, of course. Uh, great goal and, you know, an assist or two. But um, just really so many players that I think had really individual standout performances. Let me know your MVP of the game in the comments below. Or if you've got multiple, drop them as well. And uh, let me know how you're feeling about the Bones era of hockey so far. You can also let me know at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. On tomorrow's episode, I'm going to be previewing uh, Boston and Washington, kind of talking about what the Jets could even do to try and beat either of these teams on the road in back-to-backs, which uh, it's asking for a lot, let's be honest. Um, But you never know. Maybe surprises are in store for us, and that's what we're hoping for. But like I said, for tonight's episode, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thanks for making Locked on Jets your first listen of the day every day. Make your second listen Locked on Sports today. Peter Bukowski brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes or less. Get the analysis and opinions before anyone else with our local and national experts and insiders. Locked on Sports Today is available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. So subscribe for free right now because, as always, we really love and appreciate your support. As always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great night, and go Jets go.